gentlemen, please welcome John Newton. Good morning, everybody. I'm actually, I don't live in this country, despite my accent. I actually live in the UK. And so that's a little bit of context behind the story I'm about to tell you. So we've heard a lot about virtualization and cloud, and you're going to hear a whole lot more about that for the rest of the, of the day. But I'd like to talk to you about the user's perspective. And from that perspective, uh, content is extremely important. First of all, the most important part here. So Jackie, I know you're tweeting out there. That's my uh, tweet address. And those are our tags. It's Red Hat and then also al fresco. So once upon a time, a long, long time ago, IT was controlled by the firm. You didn't buy it for your home. The company bought it for you. And then you use it at work more often than not, because that's how you got connected to everybody else. And IT was controlled by a priesthood of very highly intelligent, very logical people. And that's the reason a computer science degree was the highest paid undergraduate degree you could get. And they controlled and centralized all applications, all data, all information. And technology would just flow from very large companies into the small and medium-sized businesses, into the home office, and then finally to the, uh, to the uh, consumer. And these applications were very good at the things that they were designed for, command and control, transactions. And they were deployed very, in a very limited fashion with very few people and provisioned by a central IT organization. And they were very controlled. People made sure that you didn't update things that you, didn't, you weren't supposed to update. And unfortunately, these applications had no style whatsoever. And their presentation was really not very pleasant. And these user interfaces were really, really powerful, <laughs> but not extremely user friendly. But there were some very powerful forces of good at work here. We just heard about Moore's Law. Moore's Law is great. It makes things really fast, faster and faster, doubling every two years. And that led to the internet, with billions of people now connected 24 hours um, a day, seven days a week. And that led to handheld devices that you could access the internet. And that's going to be reaching a billion people on smartphones in just a couple of years. And that led to social networks, where we're all connected together where we can find all our old friends and get reacquainted again. And the whole time, the cost of everything is just going to zero. It's just so cheap, you can just throw these things away. And this cheaper technology had new people using this technology that never used it before. So, you know, I graduated from Berkeley in 1981, and, you know, we were part of the priesthood. You know, we were able to use all these things. So, and we were sort of this um, logical, concrete, tended to go down into the basement to work on our programs. And, and we were the type of people who, if they had them in those days, would probably have Blackberries. But there were a lot of people who just would never even touch a computer. They're very feeling and, 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 and love touch types of interfaces and very visual and warm and, and interactive. So something's going on here. Something has actually changed. Left brain. I'll tell you, I, I took the test on left brain. And it's all about objects and analysis and linear thinking and being very logical, very factual. I mean, we've heard a lot of facts today, haven't we? That's because it's programmers. So here, who here is actually left brain? Everybody else, I think you're in the wrong conference. This is a Linux conference in JBoss, right? 
Now, right brain people, those are the people who go to like the seafood convention here in Boston. They're, they're about people and connections, being spatial and artistic, forward thinking, very conceptual. So this is really everybody else. And all this cheaper technology made it possible for everybody else to be able to access this technology. And the applications changed as a result, very dramatically. All that right side of the brain was stimulating things with Facebook and Skype and, and Zynga, that's Mafia Wars, you know, and uh, Farmville and things like that, and, and LinkedIn and Google and, and Groupon and, and Flickr and YouTube, all stimulating the right side of the brain. This is the majority of users. And everybody cheered these things. Everybody loved this technology. They didn't care if it was in a cloud or what it was running on or whether it was virtual or not. They just love actually using these things. And the technology became democratized. <laughs> but this <laughs> sort of lack of control and, and people playing angry birds when they should be working got people very angry. Well, in reality, Angry Birds is probably no less productive than looking at your email all the time. And, and who in here is actually looking at Twitter at the moment? Okay, and, and who's on Facebook or email or whatever? And who's actually using their enterprise application, their ERP or CRM system right now? And nobody. So the technology touched everyone from their homes to their workplaces. You know, it's like it was ubiquitous. And users would start to ask, you know, why is it that I am so powerful as a consumer and yet so lame as an employee? So IT started to lose control over what was going on. People started going outside of the enterprise to actually work together. They started using tools like Twitter to communicate with each other and to start to store things in things like Facebook, where they wouldn't even dream of doing that before. And the users started to ask, why can't they have the right brain types of applications that they have at home inside the enterprise, things that allow them to collaborate much more effectively, to be able to have social media so that we know what's going on. And, and much more rich types of the, excuse me, rich types of things like video and being real time, immediate, you know, not waiting for IT and to have it on my mobile device. But the enterprise IT was not really ready for this. There was a new gener a generation of workers coming in, new types of devices, new types of content, new types of applications. And the CIO just did not know what to do with this thing. They'd say, nobody's figured this out. You know, there will be a need for consumer-like uh, technologies. And the workforce coming in is having much higher expectations on how these things should work rather than the way they used to work. And that everything's changing, but they have no idea what to do. Now, this is real information. This was taken by AIM, which is the largest content management um, uh, industry organization, and they uh, were able to survey 20 of the largest corporations in terms of what's going on inside their organizations and the applications themselves. And so the revolution happened. Everybody wanted a Facebook for the enterprise, a YouTube for the enterprise, a Twitter for the enterprise. They didn't ask about cloud and virtualization and data grids and things like that. They wanted these things. They wanted their applications to work this way. And so systems of engagement emerged that worked the way that users wanted to work. And these applications became more social, more right-brained, focusing on knowledge workers, not on the left-brain people, but everybody. They were more consumer-like, more social, with richer media, things like video, um, connected to your favorite applications with real-time communications. And I'm sure the Cisco guy can appreciate this one. 
And this social created more content, and more content created more social. These are data applications. These are actually running in the cloud. But the user doesn't care about that. They're accessing their train times. They're accessing their travel information. These are all using service-oriented architectures, but that's the last thing on the user's mind. Now, when you start to get content into these applications, what you get is engagement. You get participation. You get explanation. We saw that uh, in some of the earlier presentations to explain how these new technologies work. We use things like video. It's also part of quality as well. You can't, you can't have quality unless you measure it, unless you can report on it. And of course, results of business are often measured in content. Now, this wasn't just your parents' documents. This was things like video, audio, photographs, and, and presenting things to users like real-time market analysis, real-time meeting minutes, whiteboards, customer stories, things like explanation integrated into the application as video itself. But with all this new technology, <laughs> Sometimes things can go wrong. Uh, my son plays Call of Duty, unfortunately, and uh, we've had to change all the credit card information. <laughs> and security can be a real issue. No wonder they look all nervous. <laughs> so what we need is actually some of that old left brain stuff, the command and control transaction you know, and, and focus it on the new generation of applications, things that are more open and accessible, that are interaction-based rather than transaction-based, that are more user-centric and ubiquitous and self-provisioned. Now, I don't know how many of you were here for the first presentation um, where the woman from IBM said that, you know, WikiLeaks was a human error, not the technology. But what are we going to do about human error? You know, the technology has to help at some level. And the left brain technologies are actually able to help. And it really is about service-oriented architecture and standards. The users don't care about that. However, there's another set of services that needs to be brought in as part of the application. Because who here actually wants to build an application that nobody's going to use or that people are going to say, I hate it. You want, you want applications that people actually like and are more effective and viral. So what we want is things like collaboration and social services, search and discovery, communication, process and workflow, and content, and UI and portal services. And to be able to make those accessible anywhere, on any type of device, not just on laptops, not just on desktops, but eventually it's all going to be on tablets and phones. So this led to architectures that allowed applications to be built for a more right-brained audience, but still be able to provide all the tools and capabilities that left brain architectures provide. So it can be deployed on-premise or in the cloud with super scalable data, super scalable storage, connected to all the enterprise systems of ERP and CRM, a real SOA architecture, but integrating things like rich content and mobile and social integration and HTML5 with uh, user services and, and uh, collaboration and social and search and discovery and content, especially content. And how do you do that? Well, there's a new standard called CMIS that stands for Content Management Interoperability Services. And that helped deliver content to all sorts of different types of applications. So a lot of applications are using it to access things from SharePoint, from Documentum, from FileNet, OpenText, Alfresco, really any sort of content repository. And I've been in this business a really long time, the business of content management. 
I was the co-founder of Documentum, as well as co-founder of Alfresco. And this was the, the objective that we've had for a very long time. And now we're actually getting there. Now, in terms of the services that are being provide, provided, it's the types of things that you can't get from a blob in a database. It's the types of things that you can't get from just a file on the file system. You're getting metadata. You're getting SQL-like queries, also folders and relationships. And to be able to search inside the content. And to be able to do that in a very restful way or in a very SOAP-oriented way. It was actually designed for the cloud to be able to access information, to be able to deploy content in the cloud and access it from cloud applications and make it interoperable with all sorts of different types of applications, whether it's things like Drupal or Jive for social, whether it's SharePoint, even Confluence and Jira or, or JBoss Portal, and even be able to push out into other applications like Face, uh, Facebook or Dropbox and to hook into your enterprise applications like SAP and, of course, hooked into your websites as well. Now, there is a standard uh, type of, uh, of interfaces available for this, both server and client-oriented, and it's all kind of built for you. The Apache Chemistry Project uh, was launched uh, about a year ago to be able to provide the reference implementation and the APIs to be able to access this, both from the client side and from the server side as well. So there's a session at 11.20 today if you want to uh, go to a campground meeting uh, around Apache chemistry. And so now all the users celebrated these new applications. They were all very happy because the applications in the enterprise started to work the way that they wanted to. Unfortunately, now it seems like all the bad guys and all these stories always begin with an M. And in this case, it's Microsoft. And Microsoft sort of got what was going on. They started from a very left brain approach of this. So the SharePoint architecture provided all the things that people wanted in these applications. Things like collaboration, and portals, and search, and content management, and business processes, and business intelligence, with some basic platform services around things like workflow, and management, and things like that. So that's the way they presented it to the world. And it got to a lot of people. You know, it's, a, it's a more than a billion dollar uh, company to, uh, in itself today. But the users kind of guided them in a different direction, a more right brain direction, to, to talk about the things that people actually wanted out of these technologies. So they didn't talk about the platform as much as they talked about what you get out of it, a site where you can go to, communities, get to the content, get to search, provide insights and composites. And so these guys use this to great effect. There's always somebody that was up to no good. So um, when we first started Alfresco, we talked to Brian Bellendorf, who had um, founded the Apache organization. And one of the things he told me unsolicited was, I'm really worried about SharePoint. I think it's one of the most dangerous things for open source because once users start putting all their content and their documents in there, it's going to be really hard to get it out. It's the biggest threat to open source inside the data center. And we think it, that, that there's something behind that as well because they are using this very effectively. You can have Linux or, you know, a, a fully Linux organization will still bring in SharePoint and Windows and the development environment. And it's the foothold in there. Now, what's really interesting is as a result of working with CMIS, I've worked with a lot of guys at Microsoft. And all the guys who were working on SharePoint are now being moved, at least all the ones that I know, are being moved onto developer tools. So that's something to think about, is that this becomes a, a more than just a platform. Someone asked uh, Steve Ballmer, is this the beginning of a new operating system? And his, his answer was, bingo. This is, this is the direction that Microsoft is going. But open source proved to be a formidable foe by removing lock-in and opening the architecture. Now, I started Documentum, which was a traditional closed source 
way of looking at developing and building systems and deploying it. And basically, your intellectual property is the most important thing. Do not let it out of the building. Do not let your programmers outside of the building. They were surrounded by walls and walls of people, of product managers who will help interpret what the user actually wants and support, which will shield the developer from all these things and most importantly, shield them from what the bugs are because heaven forbid that the, uh, that the competitors actually find out what our bugs are and then reception and sales. So the customers and the partners were kept outside the walls. But open source, by its very nature, is social. It is the, the genesis of all these social systems where the code and intellectual property play an integral part of the development of this environment. And also, the community as well, talking about what's going on. And the customers can be part of it as well, as well as support engineers, partners, everybody else. So everybody working together should provide a strong foundation for these types of applications. So some open source, some companies saw through this and used open source using Red Hat and JBoss and Alfresco. So we did a survey of our customers last summer, and we just asked them, why did you choose Alfresco? And what was your primary reason? The number one reason was that it was open source, that it didn't lock them in. So it was much cheaper, and we, thought, we actually thought that low cost was gonna be the reason that came up that people bought it. No, it's because it was open source, as well as other things. So for instance, like this construction materials firm. So this is a company based in Europe, over $30 billion in revenue, over 200,000 users, which are employees, in dozens of com uh, countries. And they were a bunch of silos, all these different companies working together. And they, they didn't work together, in fact. They were just kind of doing their own thing. So how could the company actually get people to work more effectively? How could they get all their SAP systems to work together? How can they take and deliver information in a consistent way to all their customers? So they wanted to be able to integrate this, so they used social to be able to do that and eliminated the whole email thing and, and various other types of uh, communication to be a much more active stream of what's going on and people being more aware in real time of what is the best way to actually do things and to be able to search on patterns of how people used information and to be able to work with customers as well. Or CSC, over $15 billion in revenue, trying to look at what is a more effective way of delivering services to their client. So they wanted to be able to accelerate communications both inside the project and between projects as well. So they did it at two different levels. The developers actually integrated all this stuff into uh, JIRA and Confluence, so as they were tracking problems or whatever, they would be able to bring in the information of what the customers were doing and also be able to deliver that to the customer. Or the project office, to be able to use social to figure out what, is the, what are the problems right at that moment and have other people participate in that. And to be able to integrate all the information and specifications into the, um, that are inside of Alfresco across the entire corporation. So all of these right-brained applications were able to take this data platform but put a completely different spin on this. It isn't about the bits and data and whatever, it's about how the users actually use it. It's about people. It's about the communications between people. It's the processes that they're involved in and it's the content. All of these provide the context in which you can access the right information at the right time and deliver it, deliver it to people. So this becomes an integral part of the business. It becomes part of sales and marketing, it becomes part of the strategy process, products and logistics, and all the different enterprise applications. Layering on top of those systems, social information and, and interactivity. And that's the way that you know, we left brain people would probably think about it. But from the end user's perspective, it's working the way that you want it to work. So this led to conversations between employees and customers and, and the rest of the world, where 
you are at the focus of this, not the data, not the system, not the cloud. You are at the focus of this. And the content helps explain and interact with all the different people. And to be able to integrate you as part of your product and your service, rather than just being a, a cog in the wheel. And so all this right-brained stuff and right-brained employees and left-brained IT were able to grow revenue as a result of being able to take these applications and not just make sure that it gets done and it's functional, but is actually usable. Now, that's actually me on the right-hand side. I was invited to a party at Buckingham Palace, and it was amazing. The after-dinner uh, entertainment was Cirque du Soleil. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. So I've met Prince Charles, and I've been to Buckingham Palace, and therefore, that makes me an expert on all the royals, as you can see. And uh, so our investor on the left is uh, Jim Schwartz from Axel. There are also investors in Facebook as well. And there he is explaining to Prince Charles that the future is not in the monarchy, but in content. And they all lived happily ever after. So um, if you'd like to see some more, we are the booth right next to the alcohol in the evening. And uh, <laughs> also, uh, there's some examples of how Alfresco is work, uh, being used in different corporations. One is Red Hat itself, Red Hat training materials using Alfresco. So that's at 1130. And then there's a good chemistry panel where we talk about uh, Apache chemistry. Uh, so a panel of experts on content management, and that's at 2 p.m. And I've already mentioned the uh, CMIS camp as well with Florian Mueller, who's the um, actual lead um, on Apache chemistry. And therefore, that is the end of the story. Thank you very much.